Hi, Rob. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, it's an interesting paper. Yeah, yeah, it, it got me thinking about lots of different sort of adjacent things and related to the stuff we've been talking about as well. So, yeah, I hadn't thought about this for a while. I started digging into it and uh, kind of I realized how little I actually knew about what was going on. About what? Clustering? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll wait to the other guys come on and I'll show you some crafts I made. Cool. Where is that? Uh, Not that one. Hi, hey guys. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Good. It's like my dodgy headphone cable. How's it going with you, Pam? Good? Yeah, yeah, it's been great. No complaints. Interesting projects and stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's lots, lots more coming. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a busy time for us. Oh, okay, good. Well, that's good news. And how's it going with you, Rob? I uh, saw the, that email you sent me. Very cool. Yeah, just look at the introductions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll, I'll check them out. But um, we'll just see if Rose is going to join us. Oh, what's this one? Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I, I did a couple things. Um, one is I was kind of looking at uh, how this current paper kind of fit in the broader literature. And this is I don't know if it's uh, it's the right one, but it's kind of a little bit of a bridge to the stuff that's gone on um, since the time this was written. But let me, uh, looking at this paper got me uh, thinking about uh, sort of what's going on here. So I think Rose is coming in. Yes. Oh, I think she dropped off. I think she's trying again. Let's just linger 30 seconds and she, she can yeah. join us. So I'll just read the intro. So. Well, now it's just, uh, there's a kind of a section on prior work in there. Oh, okay. That takes um, the, the paper that we're talking about and, and kind of describes some of the stuff that's gone on um, since that time. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So this paper is 2020. Oh, hey, Rose, welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm jumping in to say that I can't stay today. I have a sick child who just oh, no. uh -oh. going to drop off, but it's not because I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go and deal with real life. And we'll yes, see exactly. yeah. All um, right. Hope I'll catch up. Soon. Okay, I'll catch up with you guys next yep. week. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, all right, go ahead. Okay, so let's see. Let's see if I can share this. Uh, this is stuff that I discovered. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so you see this, uh, you see these two pictures here? Yes, indeed. All right, so the question is uh, which one is the random data? <laughs> That's a very interesting philosophical question, but yes. Uh, I'm guessing the left one. Yeah. Because well, there's the, more clumps. <laughs> the, the answer is both. <laughs> hey, that was a trick question. <laughs> these, these are two independent uh, random distributions. So, I'm, I, so, you know, as I was looking at this stuff, I was thinking, okay, we got these clusters, but what do they really mean? Okay, so I thought, all right, well, let's for fun just create random data and see what happens when we run the clustering algorithms on them. Well, guess what? You get four nice clusters. 
All right, now um, let me try another data set. You know, same random, same underlying data generating process too, but same random numbers, and you get basically the same four clusters again. Um, now what we got down here, this this one's a little more informative. Um, so these are I, I took these two. So the collectively now these are four data series together. And I did a uh, eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector decomposition on them. Mm -hmm. So what comes out of this is there's basically no explanatory power via the eigenvectors right. or eigenvalues, which is kind of reassuring, I guess. Yes, <laughs> even if it is uh, epistemic luck, it's nice to see. <laughs> um, so I guess, you know, I'm looking at the, these clustering parts and thinking, okay, what do they really tell us? And I thought, okay, well, if we have two independent samples, um, you know, what random stuff, what's that going to look like? Um, but, you know, it, my, my hunch is if we ran the deep learning clustering algorithms on, on this stuff, we would get something that kind of looks like this. So I have every intention of actually getting it working. It's just my uh, Linux box uh, is set up differently. So I need to set up Docker with the NVIDIA stuff so I can get the, um, the uh, cafe. You got it working, right? Did you just pull down the GitHub and run it? Uh, no, I, I'm not using, yeah, nobody's using CAFE anymore. I think we, we just re-implemented it in TensorFlow back in the day. Oh, yeah, so this was a while ago that you did this? Yeah, that was when I was at MDA, like the early time, maybe uh, four or <laughs> five years ago. Oh, okay. No, the CAFE is completely, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't have a CAFE implementation. Yeah. But there are probably more modern implementations you can find on the web with anything you want. I'm just genuine. And I think Rob kind of beat me to the punch very well and truly here, which is, what is it telling us? Like, um, I mean, yeah. Um, okay, so, <laughs> you know, I, I looked at, um, I mean, kind of off topic, perhaps not so much, but I started to dig into clustering validation. Oh, okay, that's a very interesting topic, yeah. Um, but it essentially doesn't solve this type of problem um, because what it's doing is it's kind of getting at, um, you know, do we have three clusters or four clusters or two clusters? So you're looking at measures of, roughly speaking, how close the points are to the given cluster, and then sort of how far are the points from the other clusters. So basically measures of distance from the, the designated cluster and sort of from the other ones and some sort of ratio of that stuff. I see. But that's not going to solve that's not going to solve this problem at all. But but I guess that's not I mean I wouldn't see this as a problem. It's just the kid like if you go looking for a cluster, you're assuming there is one. If there right. isn't one, you're of course going to get garbage. I mean you can fit yeah. any function to random noise. Do, you're going to be able to fit it probably with enough parameters. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with your function fitting. It's just that you're applying it to something, you know, it shouldn't work, right? Okay. But part of me think, part, part of me doesn't find that uh, convincing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not ideal that, uh, so that's why I guess um, I think that, so they get into it in the paper we read this week that like, I think the, the, the concept of distance metric is the essential here. Like in k-means, you're just looking at Euclidean distance, which is just right. too, maybe over simplistic and maybe it doesn't get you anything. But there is probably some space in your parameter space that is meaningful to have a distance. And that's where you want to do your clustering. And I think all these, at least that paper started 
trying yeah. to learn yeah. what yeah. is that space. I think that's probably the more interesting thing. And I feel like it goes to the core of all the AI stuff you're trying to do, right? What is similar, what is different? Like that's like the whole problem we're trying to solve. So I don't think just running a simple algorithm is gonna solve, like if you can solve the what's similar, what's different problem, you're already done with solving AGI, I think. No, no, but there is, Okay, so this, this other problem, uh, the liquidity problem we kind of spoke about before. Um, part of what I did was to say, okay, um, so liquidity and finance is sort of this ambiguous term. Um, no, there, there's no good definition and there are multiple ones and they sort of overlap. Um, but what I tried to do is to look at whether I could get a cluster um, of a certain liquidity value and then see whether that had predictive power for what would happen the following day. So that was sort of my notion of, you know, if there's some predictive power, then it kind of means the clusters are perhaps more legitimate. That's very interesting. So you're suggesting we should actually cluster based on predictive power, which they didn't do in this paper, as I understood. I, I, I'm trying to come up with something, and that's that, that's sort of the first thing that came to my mind. Good idea. It's so uh, I'm pretty sure somebody has tried it. Maybe the paper you sent already has that. But so in this paper, they combine two things, right? Like usually clustering was completely unsupervised, right? Like it's just right. based on that distance metric. You assume that you know the right relevant space, you do it. So that was the first stage. What these guys did is they're trying to, at the same time, learn what's the right space to do the cluster. Mm -hmm. So is liquidity the right space or is there some other thing? I feel like we need to add another thing and that's some kind of soft labels. Like there are probably some things you already know are relevant for mm -hmm. predictive power. If you could also feed that in and try to optimize all the three at the same time, maybe that'll get you something. Because um, I can tell you what the problem I ran into when I tried to apply this. Like we were trying to cluster images. Uh, so we had a bunch of images of boats of different type and we needed to classify this. And we had a limited label set. So we didn't have labels for all of them and it would have taken a long time and lots of money to label it. Uh, so what I thought we would do is just cluster it and then go look at each cluster and see, okay, these are all the motorboats, so great. So I can use that as a label. And so what happens is though, like the clustering algorithm finds things that maybe you don't care about. Maybe you find all the red boats. It just mm -hmm. learns that color red is one way to cluster things and we don't care about that. So I feel like what you care about is not fundamental. It's something we care about for whatever reason. It's not in the data. So you need to somehow put that in there to guide the algorithm. Like this is the kind of thing I care about. Yeah, so how do you do that? Yeah, so I think one idea is to give it some idea like, Let's say in your in your let's say you have ten thousand points you're clustering, give some of them like assign some of them to the centroid of clusters, and just basically that would be your constraint that these guys have to go together. Now find me a cluster. Um, so I think you can do things like that and then try to maybe iteratively adjust that. So well, you're bootstrapping the system with uh, exactly. a external bias, which we I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I think it's a great idea. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're trying to seed the clusters with something that we do know. And if the system drifts so far away from that, that uh, uh, I would suggest that perhaps that's an indication that our intuition is off. That no, no, sense. but it won't, right? Like, I don't mean it to be like an intuition prior. It's like something you want. There's no nothing right or so wrong. So it, it remains same. attractive. The bias persists beyond the first. Yeah, yeah. So you, you put that in. So basically, if you try to deviate from it, the cost in your loss will go so up. So there's a fixed that, point where you want it to, to hover exactly. around. Yeah, okay, yeah. So ahead. think of it as a hint. Like you tell the algorithm, this is the kind of thing I want clustered together. And if it tries to deviate from it, it'll, it'll get penalized in the cost function, so you won't do it. Uh, so you won't get all the solutions, but maybe you get the ones that you care about more. Worth trying. I'm sure it's been tried. Like, I don't think this is an original idea. Like this is 2015, the paper we read, that was when neural networks became sort of more popular. I'm sure somebody has done this by now, but I don't know how to search for it, but I, I bet it exists. <laughs> I bet you're right. Rob, come on. 
Yeah. Um, so let me see, just make sure I understand what, what you were trying to do. So it's as if um, you would take the clusters or potential clusters and you would try to map them into stuff that you recognized. Yeah, you, exactly. And, and use that as sort of a feedback mechanism to say, okay, you know, let's kind of cluster around this stuff. Well, I mean, so that's what I did for that project. Like I, I hoped that when I do the clustering, so I knew there are like seven classes of ships, right? So I knew that going in or seven that I cared about. So the number of K was fixed for me. I knew that what was the right answer. So then I would cluster into seven and I was hoping that the clusters that I get automatically will correspond to what I care about. This is a motorboat, this is a whatever, a tanker. And, mm -hmm. and so what I found was two or three of them actually did, like motorboats are smaller than everything else. So they all did cluster into a meaningful cluster. But then there were other things, like I got clusters of like red ships, which I don't care about the color of the ship, I care about the type of the ship. So that kind of thing I had no control over. Um, so what I wanted to do was to maybe initialize the clusters with a couple of examples of each class that I actually care about, like put all the tankers in one cluster. So let's say 10 example of each and use that as an initial condition and then run the sort of clustering algorithm. Yeah, and that seemed to work? No, because uh, I didn't do this. Uh, I didn't add it to the cost function. Basically what it did was it would start with the thing, but then it would shuffle things around. So there was nothing to keep it from shuffling the things in a way that it would go again to all the color things into one spot because i didn't fix that these have to be belonging to this cluster um that's not part of this code i guess that's something i'm proposing we could build in that mm -hmm. you, you don't give the algorithm permission to shuffle reshuffle things the things that you put in uh to start makes sense to me um is that uh, so I did a search on semi-supervised clustering and I found a paper, I'll share it with you just very quickly. I mean, I don't have the paper, I'm just saying that there's some stuff out there on, this is a summary paper on 2019 on semi-supervised clustering. Uh, I, I don't have the paper or anything. Just, no, I think that's a good keyword to search, yeah. I think that's, that's right. Um, okay, so I just want to just shift uh, a little bit to look at this from a slightly different perspective. So when I hear you say, uh, apply constraints that persist throughout the training process. I think of cars, finite infinite games, where essentially you are defining the boundaries of the game that you're asking the AI to play. And that, in my uh, intuition, maps to reinforcement learning. So this is inductive. So it is reinforcement learning in a sense, in an inductive sense. But is there something from reinforcement learning that colors the picture differently than these kinds of approaches yeah so that's that's the the, the, nice the thought i was it. telling rob like this is what got me thinking about reinforcement learning i actually i don't know I, I i maybe i'll give you like a very pessimistic answer to that and tell me why i'm wrong i guess i i feel like so in reinforcement learning remember you have that markov uh, assumption right that uh, given the current state, you need you have all you need to know to predict the next state. Right. That's sort of what the entire field is built on. Um, but I would say like these clustering things almost like prove or suggest that um, depending on what you care about achieving next, like the state you have doesn't have all the information. You need to restructure it in a different way. So right now the state space in a reinforcement learning algorithm is somehow uh, uh, specified right either it's a table it's a neural net it's whatever it's some function that's fixed and you basically operate on it and you try to maximize the reward but i'm saying even from state to state you might have to like um, evolve your state space in uh -huh. a different way to get at the different problems you're trying to solve and that's yeah. just completely beyond the current paradigm of like reinforcement learning i feel uh -huh. like this is what these clustering things are showing us that uh the 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 future and past are not independent given the present because depending on what you want in the future, there's different components of the past you need to encode in your state space. And no matter how you do it, you're going to be missing something. So you have to sort of, that's, I guess that's what goes back to this whole, like the way humans do it, right? Like you have some model of the world, but you don't just make snapshot decisions based on that. Sometimes you have to go think back, change your perspective. There is some process happening 
of, I would say, revising your state before making a decision uh -huh. forward. Whereas in reinforcement learning, the state is fixed. You just keep making the system one, I guess, if you like system one decisions, and you hope that your state is enough to make all the future system one decisions you need for any given scenario, which is ridiculous. Um, okay, wow, progress, very good. No, no, I understood every word you said, very clear. Yeah, so it made me, made me think about, I guess, the shortcomings of reinforcement learning, but I, so I wonder if there is a way to actually dynamically change the state space of a reinforcement learning algorithm while you're training, like, I don't know. Sure. I think that would be an interesting direction. I mean, I, I thought I, I've seen some stuff like that. Uh, it's called stochastic urban reinforcement learning. Or well, I mean, states perhaps, are stochastic, right? I mean, that doesn't, I mean, stochasticity is fine, but um, like even what you would encode in a state space might be. So it's, um, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 stochasticity is fine. So yeah, do we all, yeah, RL is okay with that. Okay, so I mean, David, think about the uh, the regime shifting or the mm. regime models. Okay, so in that case, sort of you're toggling back and forth between two uh, RL environments. Yeah. So, uh, did you read anything, either of you? No, I have it in my audio book, but it was complicated. I couldn't, uh, I feel oh. like I need to read it. I couldn't listen to okay, it. Okay, so, so the, the, the hypothesis that's explored in that one, uh, which I think speaks to this in a very kind of, um, you know, trivial way, is there's this guy called an encanter, and the encanter essentially doesn't just live in one reality he lives in parallel universes and he has cross perception of the other parallel universes and he can essentially run forward simulations or see into the into to multiple futures um, at once and then select which future he wants to continue to explore uh, it's a really interesting it's right at the end of the book i'm not trying to spoil it i would highly recommend reading the book i've read it like 10 times but um so the idea is, is we have, and this unfortunately gets very confused with the language of causal uh, inference, which I'm reluctant to use the word, but uh, basically the idea is uh, that you go through regime, regime shifts, you, you change tracks. So imagine a bunch of trains on separate tracks and they're all kind of going and then one of them's not going so well. So you, that's not the track you want to go on. So you get off that track and then you get on another track. Um, so perhaps this kind of uh, regime shift, narrative switching, uh, there's lots of different names for it. Um, can we essentially, I guess it's kind of almost, uh, an evolution algorithm where you have competing parameter spaces that have persistence over some longer time period. One will actually have obviously have a clear benefit in the short time frame, and so uh, it might drive the others extinct. But typically, the others have more staying power than that. And even though one particular model has a short term advantage over the long haul some of the other more uh, quiescent models will come to the fore and, and take over. Not sure if that's useful, but can we sustain for longer periods of time genetic variants of the parameter space that you're talking about, right? The state space of the reinforcement learning. Can we genetically evolve the state space itself where we use priors as seeds, but then we randomly change or add or you know, induce a regime shift in the, uh, in the prior to explore a different narrative? Does that make a sense? I'm not sure if I'm... This sounds like the, the I think we talked about Kenneth Stanley like a while ago, like neuroevolution. Um, okay. uh, he has a great book that I highly recommend, uh, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. So it's, it's, it's all oh, about evolutionary algorithms. He was on the... Yeah, why greatness can't be planned. There's another book like this. There was a, a the machine learning street talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was on there too. Yeah, twice. Like in recently, he came again. Yeah, time. yeah. So yeah, those yeah, are all that good. guy. Um, but yeah, I think that's sort of related to the stuff he talks. About. I mean, he he's sort of 
advocating going beyond like objective functions or fitness functions because yes 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 uh, because there are things like he has lots of great examples in his book like if you if somebody set out to invent a computer they would not because there's a lot of stepping stones that have nothing to do with computers and unless you had those you would have no chance of building a computer so there is no sort of back propagation algorithm where you start with what you had and you will eventually get to a computer so you needed to have the vacuum tubes like lots of things that had nothing to do with computers and so he's sort of advocating this exploration uh sort of set which of gets us back to the algorithm that you suggested the paper we just read which is exactly that which is this kind of attempt to use machine learning you know you know to create a loop and see what it can tell us and right. see if we can interpret what it is saying um this is also related to the search stuff i was trying to do right like uh, you can formulate it like, i think in the fixed points uh view that you shared uh, david like so let's say you start from some node this is your current state you have a bunch of choices so the three branches and branches and branches but there will be points where so i mean uh, there's at least one point at the end of all this where all the branches converge and we die right <laughs> so there are fixed points so there are nodes where there's more branches coming in than going out uh, so maybe what you're suggesting is maybe we want to sort of maximize our options going forward so that there is more choices to be made and that's the best we can do i guess that's maybe that's how politicians uh, <laughs> behave but you want to basically maybe one heuristic could be i want to maximize my future options and that's your metric that you're trying to optimize not necessarily any particular objective right so that gets us back to okay. sorry rob go ahead yeah, there's actually a way to compute probably the value of those different alternatives from an option pricing perspective. Sure. And then we, we let's say we have a limited budget, so we might just take the top 10, or maybe take the top five and then just randomly sample five from the rest just to try and keep some exploration going. Yeah, so the, the way Kenneth Stanley, like his heuristic was curiosity, right? He calls it curiosity driven. Basically, you, you will do things that you have done less often before, and you keep doing that. And that's his algorithm. And there's obviously a lot of details behind it. But so he doesn't use KL divergence and uh, asymmetry as No, because guy. there's nowhere you're trying to get to. Like, there's, you're not trying to get to anywhere. You're just trying to explore as much as possible. And if, if you find something interesting, great. If not, that's fine. Um, and so in, he had this website, I don't know if it's still up or not, where people could go and like draw something and then somebody else will come evolve different versions out of that drawing. And, they, and depending on what people find interesting, you could basically mix different paintings of different people or different versions of a different painting. And basically it would just evolve over time. Uh, and I think the picture on the book is one of the things that was evolved. It's like a really nice butterfly that just came up. Nobody was looking for a butterfly. In fact, he challenges you to go in the system and try to create a butterfly and you would not be able to. You don't have that much control over what comes out of it. But if you just sort of see what comes up and say, oh, this looks like a butterfly, then try something else. And you just keep evolving it. You get these really fancy sort of diagrams that you would not be able to get from the beginning. Okay, I'll read the book. Very good. When did it come out? Quite recently or a while ago? No, it's a while ago. Uh, I don't know if he has any recent books, but this was a few years ago. Oh, okay. Interesting. No, I know the book and I've seen the, I've seen the, I've started watching the episode. I just wasn't in the right. One of the other things about this paper to, to me that was kind of interesting um, is it kind of gets at well, it, it's trying to it's trying to examine what features to use uh, for the clustering. It is and it isn't because, well, no, sorry, I'm not trying to stop you, but go ahead, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah so to, to me that that's, that's really interesting and it kind of gets back to, uh, I mean, the, the Oh, who is it that those Bronstein lectures on geometric? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I'm wondering if there is an alternative algebra that generates features that would work better for certain types of clustering. Or can 
Okay, so my 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 issue with um, this approach, and I'm, it's it's not much of an issue, but my 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 it's kind of subtle issue with this approach is is that it gives you the illusion that <laughs> it is um, somehow finding a different space parameter space, and it's not because the input data is the same. It's 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 changing the metrics of a given domain from the metrics that we provide, which are poor, which have a lot of covariance perhaps, into metrics that are more orthogonal, let's say, or at least more discriminative in a categorical sense. But what is lacking is the ability to go and collect new kinds of information that inform the algorithm. Right, so it's not it's not exploring beyond the parameter space that you've given it. It can't go back and say, you know, who was the person who drew this picture? Maybe that's the you know maybe that's the strongest uh, feature that I'm seeing. Right, and so can it somehow prompt us to go and collect more information that will improve it? Like it's not telling us what's right and what's wrong. It's suggesting that. Uh, additional information would would of a different kind. It might even suggest a kind. It might even suggest an experiment uh, that might help us achieve the goal better. So that oh. does get to. Uh, sorry, Rob. Go ahead. Um, no, I was no, just going to interject. Um, I do remember some examples of looking at data and sort of Cartesian coordinates versus polar coordinates. Um, I pull up the images, but it take me a while. Um, so the the idea was when you did it in the polar representation, um, you got clear delineations between groups, whereas you did it in sort of you know the the standard, it was sort of like a you know concentric circles versus different layers of it. I, I, yeah, guess I think that's a standard, like I think they start with that. Uh, yeah, that's basically the whole game you're playing with neural nets, right? How do you transform your input space into another space where what yeah. you want to, what, what the useful thing you want out of it is trivially obvious. Like the two things are separate. Well put, very well put, yes, very clear, yes. So, I mean, is that, is that not within, I mean, is that a kind of a, a different algebra or is that pretty much part of the same stuff? You could maybe bring in new algebra, but right now it's just like back propagation and stochastic gradient descent, right? Like you just basically, well, yeah, that's but, what we are doing. Yeah, again, on what is kind of the question. So, you know, in some sense, we, we've got a lot of functional flexibility in terms of transforming variables right now. But if there's some sort of alternative mapping that puts them into something that's more beneficial, that enables us to partition the two groups better. Yeah, so I think that the advantage of doing it with the neural networks is that it's general, right? You can apply the same procedure in any problem and you will get something hopefully useful. Like, but I don't know if like, I, I remember this course we had in complex, like it, the, what you said about the spherical coordinate reminded me of that. Like if you try to design like airplane wings uh, for like just to get maximum lift or something, there is this thing called conformal mapping where you can basically map like this complicated shape of a wing into something that resembles a square and then do all your design there is like trivial like once you do this mapping and the mapping you can always do and you always get some simple result. So I think you can go to like specific like physical examples or data sets that you can discover using ingenuity or complicated math or topology or the stuff Bernstein is talking about to do this. But then when you go to the next problem, we will have to do the same again and it will be a different thing, right? I think that what people like about this kind of thing is like you just hit the button go and sometimes you get lots of useful things coming out of it. Carry on, I just want to draw a picture. Uh, so I'm just going to draw a picture on the whiteboard here, but please, uh, it'll take me a few moments. So, um, all right, I'll just talk it through. So 
What I've been thinking about is the distinction between what's called equivariance and uh, invariance. So, um, so the way I think about, I'll, I'll just kill this for a moment, sorry. Uh, the way I think about equivariance is we all move as one, right? So the, 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 the tacky saying is, you know, the tide floats all boats, right? The, so the, the, the vertical altitude of a given boat uh, doesn't change with respect to other boats because they all go up and down with the tide. So they're equivariant. Um, invariance means that they have no correlation, right? So in the, I'll just use hand waving. So in the, the geometric deep learning stuff, what they say is, is there's this idea of local, localization. So if you have some graph and you pick a node on that graph and you travel along the edges attached to that node, one step, or maybe two steps, that's your local environment. And that's the only information that you have access to, right? So you are, you're, the information that we're using to train or to, to infer something about this node is literally defined by the, the linkages of, the, of the, the nearby topological space. So we have this thing where, the, um, where everything kind of moves as one, the equivariance, and then we have this localized uh, thing where each node is really just um, distinguishing itself from its neighbors and nothing more. And to me, clustering is exactly halfway in between. If you look at a cluster, Within the cluster, everything has to be equivariant. They have to move as one, right? So uh, they are all behaving the same way in a localized sense. But then the other nodes don't, right? They're not correlated with this equivariant. So they're not equivariant to this. They're equivariant to themselves. And what I was thinking was, um, can we essentially construct a graph based on equivariance? And maybe I'm just using like playing language games and that's already what's going on, but can we create like a graph structure that uh, minimizes uh, variance between, like if we have two nodes, uh -huh. Um, compared to all the other nodes, and we say which two nodes most move together the, the closest, and then we create a link there. And we say, okay, these two are equivariant, and we just iter we create a hierarchy using that process. No, I really like that. No, that, that's a good idea. Uh, it reminds me of there's this whole field of, uh, you probably have heard of it, like contrastive learning. Uh, it's, so basically, <laughs> all it means is that if you know two things are similar, you try to minimize the distance between them, some notion of distance. And when you know two things are different, you try to maximize that. And you try, so that's one objective function you're trying to optimize. Basically, maximize the distance between things that are you know to be different and minimize the uh, distance of things that you know to be the same. Uh, of course, what goes wrong usually is that there's infinite number of things that are different from what you want. So mm -hmm. then it all comes down to how do you pick the negative samples? Like it's really complicated to pick a good enough set of negative samples. Right, 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 right. Well, I mean, David, I, I think that's pretty much what these clustering algorithms try and do. Exactly. I think I'm just playing language games and I'm just saying what they're already doing in a different way, which isn't very useful, but uh, I'll be the oh, first. Oh, no, it, it, it may be highly useful. Um, yeah, but I, I really, so there was another form of variance, which gets back to your polar diagrams, which I thought was really, really interesting, which is an, I think it's called an isomer. This is in uh, gauge theory. So the, the only thing that you can tell about, um, and this is very related. So you can have, um, all you can tell is, is that I am a certain distance uh, across the manifold to some other point. I can't say where I am in space. I don't know. There's no metric that tells me where I am. But if I, you know, if I take a piece of string and I give it to you, Payam, and we pull it tight, and then I reel it in and measure its length, um, all the points that uh, are essentially give me that form an isomer around this thing, right? Um, and uh, to me, that's a kind of clustering, right? So if your if your piece of string that you reel in, if you will is shorter than some distance, then you can say that you're part of this cluster, which is, once again, I'm just playing word games, but um, 
that in the, in a manifold see the, the whole thing about manifolds which i found really interesting is they dispense with metrics the, the, the metrics are very very indirect like you can you can't tell much about how close you are to other things or you know where you are or anything like that it's just you don't even know which way is up as far as i can tell so there's no kind of uh univariate or, or kind of global anything is that correct thinking time is that how you should think about yeah that's it? that's basically i think the insight i got from the paper or from like looking into clustering that there is no like fundamental way to define a cluster it's all a matter of what you're looking for um so, that's, so it's how you'd measure the distance from this cluster yeah center, what you decide is... distance is and what you care about like if you just look at something that's totally structured in our brain there's nothing it's not structured it's just like we feel that's the structure we're looking for like that's why you can find i guess uh random pictures that make sense to us i guess yeah. in coffee Faces in the clouds and, which is the image yeah, yeah. on the sun right? yeah so yeah but there's a germ of something here, though. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't bother, not at all. I'm just trying to work out how we can use this affordance to. But but there is a mystery here that I don't know if I have the answer to. Like these, at least for images, like most of my experience has been in images. So I'm a little bit biased, so maybe it doesn't work for anything else. Like if you go, like they trained this huge uh, image net uh, based on the image net data set, like a ResNet 50, these massive neural networks. You go look at the last layer of that network, like it's like, let's say 2048, a vector of size 2048. You give it any image, let's say 200 by 200, and it gives you a vector of size 2048 by one, just an array. And that seems to have so much power in like doing classification and doing segmentation, like that really captures like a really a essence of the image in a way that's useful for many downstream tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a little bit uh, surprising, I guess, that somehow, so they trained this for classification, but somehow that representation that they discovered is useful for lots of other things, like clustering, for example, and, and right. segmentation, things that weren't, it wasn't trained for. So maybe there is some uh, fundamental structure in the images that we, in general, we care about. So if you go start with a random noise, like a black and white image, like salt and pepper image kind of noise, you won't get anything useful out of it, right? Like going back to Rob's example, but maybe the kinds of images that we care about, like natural images, somehow they have such a strong structure that there is this unique and very useful representation or a space that if you discover that maybe we have already, it's gonna be useful for many things. I agree. Uh, what do you mean by space? Sorry, I, I get confused here. So if I have three axes and then I have three other axes, the space is the same. I'm just using different axes to move around, no? different metrics. Uh, uh, no, so by space, I guess, I mean, so when you start with an image, so you have a, let's say 200 by 200 by three for the RGB channel space. Mm -hmm. So that's your space. And then when you go to the 2048 by one, that's a new space, which is just one dimensional array. So all the possible arrays of 2048 element is all your all you have access to in your space. So that those are two different fundamental okay, spaces. But is, right? it, it is okay. So there's a sorry to jump around like a jackass, but there's this concept in uh, category theory called a representable, and the idea of a representable is is that you can reconstitute what's important about the image from the 2000 numbers. So given these 2000 numbers, and this is the generative side, you can kind of go back, like it won't be the image that you gave it, but it will be an image of a cat. Yeah, so that's what they use in this paper, right? If you read the autoencoder they used, so mm -hmm. autoencoders is basically, that's exactly what it is. You basically find a feature that you can reconstruct back the original right. image as right. well so, as possible. Uh, but again, the problem with doing it in an unsupervised way, like, if you want to find a feature that you can reconstruct the original image from, that feature is actually is not very useful for downstream tasks. So you'll find something that would compress it, but it's usually not useful for downstream tasks. Uh, so I was surprised to find in the paper, I think things have changed since they said that because they, they've cited a couple of papers where they said this was useful. But the feature or the representation that an autoencoder discovers is often not very useful. So that's why you wanted some kind of a task downstream uh, that has labels and that will give you a representation that's more useful. 
So basically, so, automatically in an unsupervised way, it's not really possible. Like if you if your metric is I want it compress it to the minimum size possible, so then I can reconstruct the image. What you encode in that uh, compressed version is not necessarily what you care about the no, most no, I, for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, Rob, do you have a comment? Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no I, I just yeah. I mean, I I found that part. I don't understand it fully yet, but I found that part to be... So they're trying to induce a prior using an autoencoder is my understanding, right? They're trying to say, we don't know where to start, but let's use an autoencoder and that'll give us something. And then we'll start from there and then we'll run induction. Is that my... Yeah, so they're desperately yeah. trying to remain unsupervised, right? Like to have no guidance for the algorithm. And the only way to do it and still like reduce the space, the size of the space is, an is auto using autoencoders. Sure. Or yeah, an I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of a... or whatever. An algorithmic uh, implementation of uh, Iam's uh, earlier classification of boats. Right. So I would argue that there is something that you could do with an autoencoder, and I'm sure somebody's done it, which is to essentially try and when you create a feature, try and build an action space along that feature. Is this feature something that can participate in an intervention that has an effect? So if I, if I have an autoencoder and it generates a set of features and one of them, when I change it, it has a strong effect in the system, then I would argue that it is a, 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 a what is the, uh, some label, I don't have one, it's more significant because it is actionable. There you go. It has more actionable inf influence. Influence is a good word. There we go. Let's use the word influence. A great idea. I've seen similar ideas. Like, so one idea is this whole field of active learning, which you don't see a lot of papers on because it's really hard to study academically. But I bet in industry, everybody's doing it because you can't do it without it. So you, you go collect some data. So let's say, like, some simple task, like, let's say, binary classification. You go collect some data set, you run your classifier, you get some accuracy. So the idea is the model would then tell you, look at the examples that fell too close to the boundary, and it asks for more examples of those. So the more examples of cases you have that are close to the decision boundary of your classifier, the better the classifier gets over time. So if you just go randomly collect more data, maybe you get a bunch of data that are not relevant because yeah, exactly. they're already like easy. So it, yeah. it gives you a notion of what's hard, what was hard for the model and it'll ask you mm -hmm. for more of those. So that's sort of, you can bootstrap your way into better and better models. Similar, but there's a subtle difference, which is this interventional power, right? I'm, the, I'm obsessed with this idea of an affordance, which gets you out of the fixed point, right? So if you're in system one and you're close to a fixed point, you're trapped forever, right? You'll just run around in the cage until you die. And so we need to find these special affordances, these super functions that can get us out of, away from the fixed point, right? That we can use to escape the, the gravity well. And um, perhaps these autoencoders uh, can generate parameters that we can then essentially adjust and see if they do move us in or away from this fixed point. And if they kind of are orthogonal to the fixed point, then they might give us a trajectory by which we can get out of this trap, if you will. Um, and that to me is the foundation of a system to style system, which is- Yeah, so you should, you should be able to search over the autoencoder outputs to find ones that make that work better, right? Yeah, you should be able to backprop through the autoencoder, and this is crazy. I don't know what I'm talking about, but can we sort of somehow backprop through the autoencoder to find the minimal set of parameters that have the most influence in terms of actions, in terms of moving us, like moving like, around like the fixed point confused. isn't useful. Like we're just going in circles. Like wanna. <laughs> Ahead, Can you Ryan. clarify a little bit, like, what do you mean by actions? I mean, I feel like I'm confused because all these models we're looking at, there are no actions. It's just you have an input, you have a prediction. There is no action. What do you mean by action? Um, should I go northeast, south, or west? Okay, so I take the action to move north. All right. But then so, you are in reinforcement learning. Then this is obviously not adequate to just have a neural network to tell you what action to take because you are assuming IID data in all these neural networks. Uh, 
So I'm assuming data that they, should be yes, you are correct. You are correct. I was I was mixing settings. Well spotted. So I was I always think in terms of because I do agent simulation, I can't help myself. I always think of a an agent in space using this model to decide the next action that they're going to take. But um, what I'm saying is is that the agents aren't competing in terms of the action space that available to them, the functions that are within their, um, that are available to them, it's the order and sequence uh, and choice of those functions uh, that uh, essentially define how the agent moves through parameter space. Um, not very useful, but yeah. I mean, I guess that's the idea behind, I guess, deep reinforcement learning, right? You use these neural networks to sort of give in some input, let's say a picture of what's in front of you, what action should you take to, and I guess the goal there is to maximize your future accumulated reward. And that's what you try to maximize and reward is something you have to specify of what you care about. So in that sense, I guess, these algorithms are trying to learn what's the best way you should do, you should take an action to Mac, but I feel like they're like hopelessly inadequate. Like there's no way to do that without the feedback that you're talking about. I mean, here the feedback is just many, many, many interactions with the same environment uh, until basically you have seen everything and you know what, what's going to happen. Um, um, of course, I'm, I'm simplifying it a little bit. You haven't seen anything, but you try to estimate a function where given the input, you know the value of every action. So that's sort of what they try to get at, which is really hard, I guess, from a human perspective, that's really hard to do. Well, I mean, the, the Q learning tries to solve that by, you know, trying to solve the same problem bunches of times, right? Yeah, that's basically all of reinforcement learning tries to solve that. Um, and I think that all it does is basically try, it makes sure that you don't uh, repeat the same function value. It's basically as efficient as possible of trial and error learning. Um, so you don't retry things that you know the answers to, but you try things you don't know the answers to and you sort of evolve your value function continuously. So the, the to say that same thing differently, um, if we talk about um, Shannon information or Shannon entropy, right, this idea of surprise or new information, um, the system shouldn't change if you give it old information, but it should change if you give it new information. So it has an inherent sensitivity to surprise and will go through a regime shift. It will change its parameter values based on seeing a stimulus that is foreign to what it was predicting. Yeah, I think so. I mean, if you look at the learning curves for like one of these agents, it's usually there's like a lot of nothing happening, nothing happening, nothing happening. And then the agent accidentally finds something useful and then suddenly the reward jumps uh -huh. and then it sort of stays there and then there's nothing happening for a very long time and then there could be another jump. So it's very discontinuous where you discover something new, then the value function suddenly changes. Right, but you have no way of anticipating because you don't know, because you're wandering around in a fog. Yeah, so I'm saying it's just random trial and error search. So like it's, it's no luck. intelligence. It's a, it's, it, it's yeah, a way of, of bottling epistemic luck. Right. Yeah, basically. That's I'm why I'm kind that. of a little bit skeptical that RL, like as it is now, like, of course, they're going to change the definition, right? Like maybe somebody comes up with a new way of like new algorithm or something, and then they will, of course, be also part of RL and they say, oh, RL works. But the way it is now, it's just not useful for anything practical. So does that stuff go under the heading of deep RL? Yeah, so whenever you use a neural network within a RL framework, it's called deep RL. Okay. So you can use it for like estimating your value function. You can use it to parameterize the action space you want to take actions on. So there's different ways of using it. But as long as you stick a neural network in there, it's called deep RL. <clears throat> okay, I'll just share one one thing from the paper, which uh, is kind of my intuition. Uh, where's the paper? Is it this one? I think it's which one is that? Da, da, da. Second one. Oh, 
Sorry, I'm trying to share my screen here. It's not giving me much. Uh, okay. Share my screen. Yeah, this one. Okay. All right. So let's just look at this picture for a moment. Just kind of clar clar this, this, this was these two pictures kind of. So Rob, what's the same between row, uh, you know, this row where you have, you know, a, a, a cat, a chicken, a truck, a dog, a horse, a bird, a cougar, and like. Yeah, that's exactly what I found <laughs> too. I get these fuck? clusters that are like completely random and I couldn't figure out what's the same. Like, is there some deep insight in this clustering or is it just noise? Or is it just there is deep class there is a deep insight here, but we don't care about it because it doesn't. Uh, this is well, I can this, see there is lots of green in all of those pictures. Right. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. My first reaction too. Yeah. Green background versus others. I see. So the airplanes are just blobs with blue backgrounds. Then. Well, airplanes are more clear, right? There's something with wings. <laughs> Like, yeah, shiny curves, right? Just, I mean, okay. it is pretty impressive, no? Like, just to get the cars by just clustering. There's no concept of car in the model, right? But it's no, still no, no. Even, I mean, it does surprisingly well on some things, which leads me to think carefully about, you know, wackos like this one. Like, maybe it is. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've seen, I've seen examples of stuff that looks uh, to me like white noise, but the algorithms are completely convinced it's a guitar. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you can find those. You can actually construct those if very trivially if you want. Yeah. Um, but again, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm sort of, I, I've, I've got a mental mapping, I guess of when I look at those images and try and figure out how to classify them. Right, so what is it that we're doing that says, wow, it's doing a good job on airplanes and birds, but it's doing a terrible job on, you know, trucks and cats. Like, that's in your head, right? This is straight out of cut, right? Yeah, our perceptions, you know, or even about time entities, you know, man is the measure of all things. So it's just, we're just looking at our own mind. Like I could just randomly pick some images and show them to you, and then say, you know, what's the what's the co the, the correspondence, and you can invent an explanation on the fly. Is that the insight? I mean, could we use this where the human itself is part of the thing, where we say, are these two things similar? Yes or no, and we can map the boundaries of what it is that we see as being similar or not. I mean, that's what labels are supposed to be doing, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> And that's the whole point of clustering is the so the, the stuff that we don't have that. So basically, if I use supervised learning and then I use unsupervised learning, the difference between the results is the human bias. Is that what you're saying? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Nothing wrong with that, but that might help us map human bias. That's all. <laughs> so maybe this is really useful because. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the computer doesn't know. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I think for images, we're just like like a good chunk of our brain is dedicated to understanding images. Oh, that yeah. it, we just take it for granted. Like you, you look at an image for a glance and you get so much information out of it without doing any work that you feel like it should be an easy task for a computer. But look at <laughs> the size of that image, right? Like 200 by 200 by three, like that's the size of the space the, the, the algorithm has to figure out. And imagine it's kind of like the matrix. It's trying to understand the car from a bunch of like pixels that as far as it knows, it has nothing to do with each other. Interesting. Okay, uh, really interesting topic. Where should we go from here? Um, any suggestions? Should we take a look at, why don't we watch the uh, the interview with uh, the gentleman that you mentioned? I'll post it in the link. I can't remember his name. I know who you mean though. Yeah, Kenneth Stanley, yeah. Yeah, post that. <laughs> I'll look it up. I mean, I'll post it. 
excuse me, my allergies are killing me. Um, very cool. Okay, so why don't we switch to Kenneth Stanley next time and just explore that a little bit because I haven't actually learned much about it. You've read the book, I assume, Pam. Yeah, I read it twice, actually. I really like it. <laughs> it's a short book. It's like almost like a long essay, but oh, okay. um, yeah, he's really good. And his interviews are also really good. The, the first one, I would start with the first one. Maybe he was there, I don't know, about a year ago, and then he came back. I haven't watched a new one, but yeah, either one is probably pretty good. Okay, well, I'll watch both and I'll read the book and uh, uh, I'll put a note into um, uh, the alt deep stuff. Very cool, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, no, this this whole conversation is re really positive. I think it's really good. Yeah, I was hoping to pick uh, Rose's brain because I'm curious, like, do people use clustering for medicine? Because I would imagine that's the part where you want to cluster different patients together in a coherent way to help you make medical decisions. But so that's one case where maybe clustering. Well, why don't we be... start with that next time? Let, let's start there next time. And if we have time, actually, why don't we do that? Let's, 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 I think that's a better topic. I, I agree. So we'll, we'll come back to the, uh, the other one, maybe at a future date. But I think that that's actually a very, very interesting question and it's highly related to this paper. So before we kind of drift off, we should probably do that. Excellent. Okay. Good. Sounds All good. right, guys. Well, have a great, uh, great day, and you we'll see you soon. Yep. Take care. Bye for now.